Uh, we'll get started here. Welcome everyone to Climate, Conflict, and the Search for Peace, first-hand observations from COP27, Russia, and Eastern Europe with Tamara Lawrence. My name is Maya. I am the Canada organizer with World Beyond War, one of the hosting organizations here tonight. Um, the other co-hosts of this uh, event here tonight are the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Canadian and Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. Um, tonight, you'll notice that we have webinar style Zoom protocols, meaning that video and audio are locked for participants. That being said, we do encourage you to write any questions that you may have in the chat. And we've reserved a significant amount of time at the towards the end of this event uh, to address those questions, I'm sure. Many of you have many questions for Tamara, and I'm sure more will arise throughout the event. So please feel free to send those in the chat, um, and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. If you're interested in viewing captions, you can click on the bottom of your Zoom control panel that says CC, um, and that will allow you to see a automatically generated live transcript button on your control panel. However, we do want to let you know that it is an automatic transcription done by robots, not humans. So it will include errors, but we hope that that uh, helps make this event more accessible to you. With that, we are just going to get started here. I'm going to introduce Tamara and then we'll get right into things. Um, as we mentioned, we're so lucky to be here with Tamara Lawrence. Uh, Tamara is a PhD candidate in global governance at the Balsili School for International Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University. She is currently the convener of the Environment Working Group of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Tamara also graduated with an MA in International Politics and Security Studies from the, from the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom, Kingdom in 2015. She is also the recipient of the Rotary International World Peace Fellowship. She is also a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and a fellow with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. She is also on the advisory board of World Beyond War, the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, and the No to NATO, excuse me, the No to War, No to NATO Network. We are so grateful to have Tamara with us here today. Thank you so much, Tamara. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many people here tonight. A big thanks to World Beyond War and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for co-hosting this event. And also thanks to the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom uh, Canada for endorsing this event. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement I am speaking to you tonight from Waterloo, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples of the Grand River. And this traditional land is part of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, which is a peace and cooperation treaty. It is an agreement to share, protect the natural resources, and not to engage in armed conflict. It is a guide of not only how we need to be on this land, but how we need to be in the world. So um, I would also like to say at the outset that I am very grateful to a number of organizations and to many individuals for financially supporting my trip. I would like to thank the Global Network Against um, Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, Women for Peace Finland, Wilt Finland, and many uh, peace friends across the country who uh, generously donated. And I would also like to thank my husband who uh, watched our kids, our two teenage boys on his own for a month. And if you would permit me to share something personal, um, I carried my brother's ashes in my backpack. Uh, my brother tragically died two years ago, um, but he was with me the entire trip and I'm dedicating this presentation to him. So my presentation tonight, Climate Conflict and the Search for Peace is approximately 40, 45 minutes. And I will show a PowerPoint presentation uh, in just a moment. And I, I look forward afterwards to having a discussion with you and um, answering your questions and hearing your comments. 
Uh, but I would like to begin with some disclaimers. Um, I traveled to six countries for my first time over the course of four weeks, Egypt, Russia, Finland, Latvia, Poland, and Romania. What I was looking for in those countries is information about how climate change, the conflict in Ukraine, and NATO expansion are affecting these countries and what the possibilities there are for peace. I would like to acknowledge that I did not go to Ukraine, which of course is an active war zone right now. I was advised by a friend in Kyiv uh, not to come. I also have a friend who is an independent uh, journalist who's been reporting from Donbass, and I had reached out in the hopes of meeting with her, but that was not possible. And also a friend in Sevastopol, Crimea, who I could not see. Um, and I appreciate that I've only scratched the surface. I have a very superficial understanding of these countries. Nevertheless, I learned a lot. I talked to many people from all walks of life to protect the privacy of some of the people. I have blanked out their faces in my PowerPoint presentation. I listened, I observed, I took hundreds of pages, uh, hundreds of photos and many, many pages of notes. I read as much background information as I could. I've had a profound and transformative experience, and I'm really grateful to be able to share my insights with you tonight. So I'm going to start my PowerPoint presentation now. And hopefully you can all see it okay. So on Thursday, November 3rd, I left Canada for Egypt to attend the Climate Summit, the 27th Conference of the Parties, COP27 of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. Uh, it was held from November 6th to November 20th in Sharm El Sheikh, the city of peace. It's a resort town between the desert of the Sinai Peninsula and the Red Sea. And I was on the Wilt delegation for the first week of COP. And for those of you who don't know, Wilt is the, the oldest women's peace organization in the world. It was founded during World War I when women came together at The Hague in the Netherlands for a peace conference in 1915 to try to stop the war. And Wilt is an accredited organization with the United Nations and win, with the UNFCCC. With, WILF is also a member of the Climate Action Network International and the Women Gender Constituency, which was which is one of nine constituent bodies of the UNFCCC. So at COP27, uh, Wilf, uh, Wilf had a 10 member uh, delegation. Most of our delegation were members uh, from the Global South. So we had members from Lebanon, Ghana, Cameroon, Zimbabwe, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then Germany, United States, and Canada. And our priorities were to raise the issues of peace for climate justice, cutting military spending for climate finance, accounting. Uh, for military emissions and demilitarization for decarbonization. We also supported the women gender con constituencies calls for a gender responsive uh, climate solutions. And we raised the demands of the African women and girls for COP27. They had an important list of demands. The cli climate conference opened with uh, the agenda from the COP27 president who was the Egyptian foreign minister Sameh Shukri, and speeches from the leaders of various countries. The speech that stood out the most for me was that by President of Libya, uh, Mohamed Menfi. Libya is the neighbor to the west of Egypt, of course. President Menfi talked about the severe sand and dust storms, droughts, and increased heat in his country. He also explained that Libya has the longest coastline in the Mediterranean and that it was experiencing terrible sea level rise along with the migration crisis. Yet the president stressed in his remarks that Libya does not have the socioeconomic capacity to deal with, the worsen to deal with worsening climate change. And that's because Libya is poor and in crisis. And that's because 11 years ago, NATO bombed this country and helped to overthrow the government of Muammar Gaddafi. In fact, it was Canada that led the NATO bombing of Libya. Thousands of airstrikes were conducted in, um, on uh, civilian infrastructure, bridges, ports, water facilities were destroyed. Libya is still struggling to recover. And it is important to point out that before the, the NATO bombing of Libya, uh, it was one of the richest countries in Africa, 
And during this opening, opening plenary, I uh, slipped a note to the Libyan delegation apologizing for Canada's bombing of their country. And I wrote that Canada and uh, other NATO countries uh, should be held accountable and rebuild Libya. Um, I also had the opportunity to hear a Venezuelan President Maduro speak. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of excitement and animation in the room when, uh, when he spoke. And I also apologize for Canada and the United States uh, working to try to overthrow his government. Uh, after President Maduro spoke in the plenary, many, many uh, delegates came up and shook his hand. And I also had the chance to meet with the new president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, who also gave a very important speech. Um, one of the most sobering uh, times in the uh, at COP27 was listening to the scientists of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, talk about the state of the climate science. And um, you can see from, from uh, the slide that carbon emissions and methane emissions are, are going up. They said that climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying. We are not on track to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, you know, they expressed a tremendous amount of worry. Um, one of the uh, top priorities at COP was the issue of climate finance. Now, 13 years ago at COP15 in Copenhagen, the wealthy countries that are most responsible for the climate crisis pledged to spend 100 billion to help developing countries with mitigation and adaptation, um, but they can't find this 100 billion uh, dollars. Uh, they have never met this target. And there were many rallies during COP27, and you can see the pictures. Uh, uh, here on the slide, stop funding war, fund loss and damage. Militarism is the number one uh, polluter. Um, you can see here on the slide that, that the wealthy countries, the 30 countries of NATO, for instance, have been able to find money for militarism. So since uh, 2015, uh, the, when the Paris Agreement came out, the 30 countries of NATO were spending $896 billion on their militaries. And over the past seven years, it has increased to about $1.1 trillion. So the, collectively, the 30 countries of NATO have increased their military spending annually by $200 billion. So at COP27, will call for cutting military spending for climate financing, including to help fund loss and damage. So uh, uh, loss and damage is, is uh, the money that developing countries need to, to uh, help them recover from climate-induced ex uh, uh, extreme weather events and natural dis disasters, and they don't have the funding to help rebuild their communities. Uh, this $100 billion is also to go towards the UN Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund. Um, it was uh, very difficult to listen to, it's very sad to listen to uh, many activists from the Global South talk about how climate change is affecting their countries. Um, I remember sitting next on, to a woman from Tanzania on the bus and she was talking about how uh, climate change was causing uh, droughts and uh, preventing, uh, you know, rain uh, uh, to come, you know, to the crops and rural families were, were starving. Uh, children, children were dying. It was, you know, these, these stories of struggle are really, were really important for uh, for us in the global north to hear and why we, it's so important for us to put pressure on our governments to, to, you know, to meet this $100 billion pledge. And even that is not, is not enough. We need to call for more. Um, so 
Um, another priority at uh, at COP27 was the was transparency. And there was a new initiative launch called Together for Transparency. One of the keynote speakers was uh, former Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. And he said that transparency was a bedrock um, uh, you know, of the Paris Agreement. It's needed for implementation, reporting, and finance. And after his presentation, I went up to him and I asked him about military emissions. And he just gruffly said, I'm not doing uh, interviews and he quickly walked away. One of the most important announcements at COP27, uh, which was overlooked by the media, and, uh, was the announcement made by the Egyptian uh, president of the climate conference. And this was the Climate Responses for Sustainable Peace Initiative, CRISP. Um, Shukri said in his uh, presentation that peace was fundamental to climate action and cl climate justice, and he noted that Egypt had made an offer to hold negotiations to end the war in Ukraine. Many officials and many activists throughout the conference were very worried that this war in Ukraine is diverting attention and resources away from, um, you know, from uh, uh, dealing with the climate crisis. And, um, and so it was the Egyptian president at the conference that, that, that shone a, a spotlight on this and said that, uh, that this initiative was going to become a regular feature of COPs going forward. And at the final, so there's, uh, there's him at this announcement. And in fact, it was one of the longest events. There were three panels uh, during this announcement. Uh, um, and so this is, you know, really promising initiative. At the end of the first week, the Climate Action Network International held a press conference and a representative from Greenpeace International from the Beijing office said that the geopolitical divisions between the West and Russia and China were impeding negotiations and were also uh, preventing uh, the progress that's needed on the Paris Agreement. And afterwards, I went up to him and I talked to him about how worried I was that this war in Ukraine and also that this, this new Cold War that's underway between not only the West and Russia, but also with China is, you know, is, de is derailing the Paris Agreement and preventing us from rapidly decarbonizing. And, and we exchanged uh, contact information. Um, so after COP27, I, in Sharm el-Sheikh, I went to Cairo for a couple of days. Of course, it's the capital of the country um, on the Nile River. It's home to 10 million people, but I was very saddened by the level of poverty and the, pollu and the air pollution. I talked to many people in the city from all different walks of life. I visited the pyramids in Giza, the Citadel, the Grand Museum, and Tahrir Square, you know, the, the, site, the site of... Um, the protest for democracy. But one of the things that I was really surprised to, to hear from many Egyptians is that they are accepting the president of uh, President El Sisi and his government because they really want stability. They don't want the violence and chaos that they saw in Libya, Syria, Iraq, and Ukraine. They want stability for jobs and economic development. And they believe that in time, um, gradually political uh, reform will come. But it, so it just made me think how important it is to, um, to, to, to think about how democracy uh, uh, impacts uh, the level of democracy that, uh, it, it, you know, in, in a country, what people are willing to accept and the need for for economic development. And they also talked about how uh, climate change was causing more heat and, and causing real problems in the Nile, the second largest uh, river on the planet, and so important, uh, uh, so important for the country. So after Egypt, I, I realized when I was planning my trip to COP that I was able to get a direct flight from Cairo to Moscow. And as you may know there, because of the sanctions against Russia, there are no direct flights from North America or from the European Union to Russia. So I decided that I was going to, to fly from Cairo to Russia for my first time. 
there is a travel advisory from the Canadian government not to go to Russia. Um, it says the the Trudeau government says that Russia is a high risk and that it's dangerous and they're they're advising not to go. So now for most of my life, the Soviet Union and Russia has been treated as an enemy by the government, by the media, by the institutions uh, here. And I'm old enough to live through the time of the first Cold War. And I see that there is a new Cold War uh, underway. Uh, before Russia invaded on Ukraine on February 24th, Canadian diplomats refused to meet their Russian counterparts. The, the Russian Federation had an open invitation to Canadian diplomats to go to Moscow, but uh, Canada refused. And Russia also said that they would be willing to come to Ottawa to have to have meetings, but the Trudeau government never extended an in invitation. You know, I was uh, you know, I was thinking, why was there no diplomacy? Uh, you know, why was Canada escalating the conflict before February 24th? Why was it uh, refusing to meet with their Russian counterparts? Why is there this you know, persistent hostility for years against Russia? Um, why is there always this negativity and bad news about Russia? So I wanted to go to Russia to see for myself. I wanted to learn more about the country and I wanted to listen. I wanted to meet Russian people to discuss the conflict, climate change and any prospects for peace. My motivations were civilian diplomacy, strategic empathy and peace building. Um, before I arrived in Russia, I had an impression that the people would be unfriendly or aloof and that the architecture would be austere, like Soviet style, and I did have some anxiety on the plane, but that uh, quickly dissipated when I, I asked the young man sitting next to me if he spoke English, and Ilya turned to me and he said, yes, in fact, I speak English very well, and we had a really wonderful conversation. And um, I learned from Ilya that he was returning to his home in Siberia because his contract with the United Nations, he had worked for the UN for seven years in Somalia, in Mali, and in Afghanistan, doing transport for peace uh, support operations for the UN. But the sanctions caused, him, caused the contract to end and he had to, uh, returned to Russia and he was very uh, sad about this and thinking that it was very um, unfair. And uh, on the plane, we talked, he told me so much about Russia. He helped uh, uh, teach me a few words. And, and from there, it was just such a, a positive experience. I was really so impressed with uh, the country, right when I got off the plane, the airport was so nice. They had a high speed rail from the airport, the Aero Express, right into the city. The the uh, metro was fantastic, and people were so uh, patient and friendly and nice and helping me along the way. I was as I was getting uh, myself to my hotel, um, and the uh, the capital is just magnificent. It's, it's 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 beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful. Russia is the largest country. On the planet, it has a population of about uh, 143 million people. It's very multicultural, uh, very diverse, uh, different languages, different religions. Um, my first meeting the next morning was with uh, one of the editors from this uh, magazine that's in Russian and in English called Russia in Global Affairs. It's, it's an excellent resource if you'd like to get the Russian perspective. And um, and I met with this editor who, is, who told me that he's opposed to Russia's uh, uh, war or special military operation in Ukraine. Uh, this magazine is, uh, editor in chief is a very well-known journalist named Fyodor uh, Lukyanov. And he's the one who conducts an annual interview with President Putin at the Valde uh, Forum. And these interviews are available online. Um, after that meeting, I, I went to Mikimo University, the Moscow State University of International Relations. I had reached out to this university as, an, as a PhD student uh, 
uh, before I went to Russia and I asked if I could meet with students. And I was so grateful that the, that the university accepted my, my offer and they arranged to have about uh, 30 master students uh, meet with me. We had an open discussion. This seminar was organized by the, uh, the, the assistant uh, deputy dean of the school, uh, Dean uh, Dundich, Dundich uh, and it was wonderful. I was so impressed with their command of the English language. In fact, they they do their studies in two languages, in Russian and English, and then all of their students, 7,000, have to also master a third language. And the school teaches 54 uh, foreign languages. And so it was, it was really great. And there was a diversity of opinions. I shared with the, the, the Migimo uh, students uh, that uh, you know Canadian diplomats had refused to meet with their Russian counterparts uh, before February 24th, and I was really distressed by that, uh, that I wanted to come to Russia to, to, to listen, I wanted to hear the other side. And that I had come for these motivate these motivations, civilian diplomacy, strategic empathy, and peace building. I um, I also uh, let them know that uh, Canadians were opposed to the Trudeau government sending weapons to Ukraine. We wanted this war to end. We wanted a ceasefire. We want negotiations. We want peace in Ukraine. We want peace with Russia. I also told them that Canada does not have a written foreign policy. We only have a defense policy that is very militaristic and that it is influenced by our uh, defense relationship with the United States and with uh, NATO. I uh, also let them know that I'm opposed to, to NATO and to Canadian soldiers and fighter jets and warships on uh, Russia's borders. And I also let them know that I believe that this hot war in Ukraine and that this new Cold War that is unfolding are wars that we are all going to lose and that they are derailing um, uh, action on climate change and the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and how important it is for us to cooperate and to build peace. I also let them know that I thought that I saw that this conflict in three layers. The first layer at the bottom is this civil war uh, between the West of Ukraine, the Ukrainian speaking West that wants to align with NATO and the European Union and against the Russian speaking minority in Eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region. That's one layer and that's a layer that's been uh, uh, hidden, ignored, not widely reported in the Canadian media and not addressed by the Canadian government. And that the second layer, this interstate conflict between Russia and Ukraine is, is the, the layer that gets uh, most attention and is the dominant narrative. And, um, and, and this, of course, is the conflict that started, you know, February 24th. Um, but I said that I see another layer, this third layer. And again, this is the layer that's hidden and ignored. And this is the long war, the new Cold War that's underway, this proxy war uh, between the West against Russia since at least 2008. And Canada is deeply involved in this. And this is a war against Russia to weaken and to isolate it. And I let them know that what has informed my thinking about this is is Dr. Stephen Cohen's book, War with Russia. As uh, Dr. Stephen Cohen is the leading American expert on uh, Russia, and he sadly passed away two years ago. But the year before he died, he published this really important book. It's, it's, it's profound and it's prescient, and I encourage you all to get a copy and uh, to read it because he gives you the backstory about this war. The same year that uh, Stephen Cohen published his book, the Rand Corporation, which is a Pentagon think tank, released its report called Overextending and Unbalancing Russia. It, 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 it's, it's, it's absolutely shameful. I also want to mention that Stephen Cohen 
Um, the year before he published his book, he actually resigned in protest from the prestigious organization called the Council on Foreign Relation because of uh, the Cold War that they were fom fomenting against Russia. So I want to share with you what the MIGMO students uh, uh, told me and also what other uh, Russians uh, um, shared with me. So they feel that the West has been at war with them uh, long before uh, February 24th, since at least the coup in Kiev in 2014, and they see it as a Western-backed coup against the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych. Many Russians have family and friends who live in Ukraine in both the West and in the East, and in the Donbass region, their loved ones have been uh, shot at and shelled for eight years, and many of them have been injured and killed. Um, uh, many Russians do support the special military operation because they see it as a defensive operation. There are also many Russians who are ag against it. They're against all violence. Um, they um, are also very concerned that over the years, uh, Ukraine has passed laws against the Russian language and education and culture. So they see this as very, um, you know, a, a, as part of this war against Russia. They also told me that they have loved ones who have been mobilized to 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 to, to, to go to Ukraine, Ukraine, and they see it as uh, as a noble cause as doing something to protect the people of the Donbass. Um, other Russians told me that, that they have uh, family members who've been mobilized, but uh, they've fled the country. They've they've gone to uh, places like Georgia, for instance, and Turkey. They don't want to fight. Many of them tried, for instance, to get to Finland, but Finland blocked the border. Um, um, uh, all of the Russians said to me that they want this conflict to end. They want peace. They want negotiations. They believe that uh, the, the Russian government is ready for negotiations. They also want the sanctions to end. The sanctions are really harming, harming them. Uh, many of them also told, took me aside and told me privately that there's been a silencing of dissent and protest. Uh, they can't go on the street and protest. And uh, there's also been a um, a restrictions of what they can say in various institutions and in their workplaces. So this was also very troubling. And they want to maintain relationships with the, the with with the West. They want to find uh, ways that we can maintain connection and build bridges. Uh, another thing that they told me about is this decade of of, of despair and humiliation. And this is the period in the 1990s after the Soviet Union collapsed um, and the United States uh, worked with, with the, the new Russian government on uh, an economic plan of deregulation and privatization. It, called wi it caused widespread uh, misery and suffering and poverty. Um, many of the people told me that during this period, they, um, you know, they, they couldn't eat and uh, they, they were homeless. It, it was, you know, it was, it was a terrible period. And they also said that there was this, uh, this looting and plundering from not just the for oligarchs, but from, from Western com companies. And um, it, it was, it was, it was, it was humiliating. It was an awful awful time in the 1990s and it's really well represented by this painting by a famous Russian artist named Ilya Glazunov, The Market of Our Democracy, was done in 1999 and it's about 10 feet by 20 feet. I went to go and see it at the art gallery and if you look carefully at the frame it's American dollars around the edges and you can see uh, like American fighter jets. It also represents the bombing of the uh, the NATO bombing uh, of the former Yugoslavia. And and you can see uh, uh, this you know, this poverty and this ex excess and and it really represents this this period. And so they, they told me about how hard it was at the end uh, in the 1990s after the end of the Soviet Union. And this um, when President Putin I came in in 2000. The World Bank statistics show that over the past 20 years of his of, of his leadership, 
that things improved dramatically in Russia. So there was a, a dramatic reduction in, in poverty. There was an increase, for instance, in life expect, expectancy. There was improved social welfare. You can see that there was an increase to the GDP, an increase to income, and there was a dramatic uh, decline in unemployment rates. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, I could uh, go to a meeting with the international uh, physicians for the prevention of nuclear weapons to a nice restaurant in, in Moscow that was that was that was crowded. There are many nice restaurants and cafes and shopping uh, in Moscow and, 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 and other uh, uh, many nice um, uh, cities in the country. And they told, they told me about how things had really improved over the past 20 years. So I had a really fantastic meeting with them, the IPPNW uh, doctors and medical students, and they told me how they are working hard to try to rid uh, Russia of nuclear weapons and also the world of nuclear weapons, but that it is a struggle. And then I went with some of them around the Red Square, and that was really fantastic. After my time in Moscow, I took a high-speed train called the Sopsum train uh, to St. Petersburg. This train is uh, was absolutely fantastic. It, it, um, Canada does not have one kilometer of high-speed rail. And this train in, in Russia was only $160 and there was gourmet food. It was very comfortable. It was, it was absolutely incredible. I, I was telling my husband, you know, what a, a fantastic train this was and how much I wish that we had something like this in Canada. In St. Petersburg, it's just absolutely beautiful. The architecture, this is at the Palace Square. I went also to the Hermitage, the world's uh, largest art gallery. It's a fantastic um, museum displaying Russia's incredible art and culture, and the Russians are rightly proud of, uh, you know, right, right, rightly, uh, rightfully proud of their art and culture. I also had a great meeting with academics and with activists, um, and we we. Uh, shared openly uh, for seven hours. And uh, one of the stories they, they told me was how they're not able to go to peace conferences in Europe because of the sanctions. And they also told me the restrictions about speaking out and that they very much want this war to end. And they also want to have connections with the West. They do not want to be isolated. And I showed them the sign that I have, uh, yes to, uh, yes to peace and cooperation, no to NATO, and that I was carrying the sign with me in my travels. And right when I unfurled this banner, uh, one of the gentlemen you know, jumped up, grabbed my hand and, and held it with me. And he's, and he's like, yes, we, this is what we need to do. After St. Petersburg, I took a very long arduous bus ride to Helsinki. And it's really very sad that uh, there are no more trains going between St. Petersburg and Helsinki uh, uh, because of the sanctions. Now, Russia and Finland share a very long border. It's, 13, uh, it's 1,300 kilometers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Finland, is, Finland is in the process of building a wall and having armed drones fly along the border. Um, and I was on the bus, and behind me was a young woman from uh, St. St. Petersburg. She had been visiting her parents who live there. She was born in Russia, but she lives and works now in Helsinki. And she uh, is a curator at an art gallery. And she was telling me how hard it is now to go and see her family because of, uh, because of the travel restrictions. And she also said that art exchanges between the two countries are, 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 are not happening anymore. You know, and, and also she was taught, telling me about the Russophobia that's happening in Finland and how it's difficult for her to speak openly um, in, in Russian. Uh, as you know, Ru uh, Finland is going to be uh, joining NATO. This is extremely disappointing for uh, many Finns. Uh, Finland had a, a very uh, a revered position in Europe as a neutral country and as a leader of the Helsinki Act and as a founding 
As a founder of the Organization for, Se Secu for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, I met with uh, some peace activists there, Women for Peace Finland and Wilt Finland, and uh, you know we talked about our opposition to NATO. I also went to the Helsinki Peace Education Center. Uh, they work uh, in peace education in the schools, talking about tolerance and diversity. And um, uh, I, I learned a lot from the Finns, and they also told me that there was a, a, a no real debate in the media or in the parliament about Finland's accession to NATO. They feel that it was really railroad, railroaded uh, in and that it was rigged and that was forced upon them. From uh, Finland, I went to Latvia. I went to Riga. It's a small uh, Baltic country. There's only 1.8 million people. Uh, uh, Latvia shares a 200 kilometer border with Russia. Uh, most Latvians, I was surprised to learn, speak uh, Russian. I went to Latvia because Canada has a big military presence there. Latvia for the uh, uh, Latvia joined uh, NATO in 2004, and since uh, 2017, Canada has been leading a NATO battle group in Latvia at the Camp Adazi military base. This is uh, part of Operation Reassurance. Canada has doubled the number of soldiers there to about 700 soldiers. And I went to go and see this military base. It's about an hour from Riga. And uh, I held my sign and I talked to, to some of the soldiers and I talked to the, to the guards at the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the gate. And I passed a letter on to the Canadian commander saying that I was opposed to to what uh, Canada is doing and what NATO is doing there. So, so there's a lot of training that's taking place. And, uh, and you can see the military vehicles there. The satellite imagery uh, shows that there is a tremendous amount of destruction of the forest. You, you can see the, the, the lines that are, the, the, the devastation of the forest and the lines crisscrossing the land. Um, after my trip to the military base, I went to the military museum in in uh, in Riga, and I was uh, looking on all of the floors. And on the third floor of this military museum, there was a stairwell in the corner, and it wasn't marked. But I went up up the stairs, and it, on this landing, there there showed these big panels and. Of, of Latvian soldiers who had left the country at the end of the Second World War. And they had gone to North America and to Australia and to Brazil. And I was really uh, shocked by one of the images. And this is an image of Latvian soldiers in Toronto. These are the, the um, soldiers that had left. And you can see that there was a big a swastika. These are the soldiers that had collaborated with the Nazis uh, during the Second World War. And this was a migration of Latvians, not only to Canada, uh, to Canada but you know, uh, to the United States and to Australia, to Brazil. Uh, this uh, really represented this, um, this troubling, uh, history of Nazism and neo-Nazism, that this 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 very troubling legacy. There's also historical revisionism and Russophobia that is related to this, and it's something that we haven't faced and confronted. I also uh, met with a small peace organization in the capital. Uh, they are housing some Ukrainian refugees and they welcomed me to their uh, peace embassy, but I was very surprised to learn that they uh, support uh, the NATO operation in their country. They also support uh, Latvia and other uh, NATO countries sending weapons to Ukraine. Uh, there were some people who were very conflicted about this, though, because, uh, for instance, one gentleman has a family in Moscow. He has a daughter in Moscow and grandchildren, but he also has grandchildren in in Ukraine. And so he's very, he, you know, he, he's very conflicted uh, 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 about this. 
there was widespread support and U Ukrainian flags throughout throughout Latvia. Um, after Latvia, I went to Poland and uh, it's a country of 39 million people. I went to Wrocław, which is in the west of the country. This is a town that is known for its famous market square. Um, Poland joined NATO in 1999. There are a number of NATO military operations and bases there, and the United States is going to be installing this Aegis Ashore ballistic missile defense a system there, which is very provocative towards Russia, and it is increasing the nuclear threat. I, um, I met with, uh, with someone from the German Marshall Fund. This is a pro-NATO uh, think tank in uh, that has an office in Warsaw and has a number of offices across Europe and in North America, and they are very much pushing NATO's agenda. And of course, they support uh, the NATO operate, uh, the, the NATO sending weapons to Ukraine, and they want uh, Russia to be defeated. When I was in Rotswaf, I met with a university professor who is uh, feeling very alone and isolated and very opposed to the to the NATO presence in her country. And um, and we talked uh, for many hours about what we can do. I also met with a group a, of Ukrainian refugees who work for a Romanian company. And uh, this meeting was held in uh, Warsaw. This uh, company in Romania has offices throughout uh, Europe and it is, um, they, they do, they work in the automobile industry and uh, they've hired a number of Ukrainians. And what was interesting about this meeting is, is that uh, what the, the Romanian man was doing the translation, but the Ukrainian refugees were from both sides of the contact line. So from the West and from Eastern Ukraine. And they were talking about how um, how Russia destroyed their community in the West, and then how NATO-backed Ukrainian security forces had destroyed their homes in the West, and they want this war to end. They uh, don't support what NATO is doing. They don't support what Russia is doing. They don't want uh, to fight themselves. They want um, jobs. They want to take care of their families. They want this war to end. They want to be able to return. And they they said, you know, we are brothers. We, um, you know, we don't want this fighting. We, we want it to end. Uh, then I uh, went to Romania. Romania is um, in uh, South uh, Eastern Europe. It's a country of 9 million, 19 million people. Romania joined NATO in 2004. I met with one of the representatives from the, the, the biggest, most active trade union called Cartel Alpha. And she told me about the increasing uh, poverty in the country, about one third of Ukrainians are, are really struggling to make ends meet. Um, in October, a month before uh, our meeting, Cartel Alpha had a huge rally in uh, the capital in Bucharest. Uh, about jobs, economic uh, security, trying to end poverty. They were concerned about inflation, the war in Ukraine, and they want all of this end to end. They want the, uh, the government to be uh, responsive to their needs. They see the government as uh, very corrupt and not caring for the people. I also met with a, a group of men, a, physici a physician, construction worker, and an activist. The activist was telling me about a Canadian uh, mining company that had tried to set up a mega a gold mine in uh, the west of the country. Uh, Gabriel Resources uh, wanted to establish this 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 mine, but it was going to cause you know tremendous environmental damage. They have the, this be these beautiful uh, hills, the Car Carthanian Mountains, and they they didn't want this damage. Of course, and there were mass protests over many years to, to stop this development. The government finally listened and stopped the project, but unfortunately, uh, Gabriel Resources is suing Romania for uh, $4 billion. While I was um, in Romania, I also reached out to a peace organization called Petrir, and this is located in Cluj-Napoca in the center 
of the country. Unfortunately, I couldn't go to see them in person, but I had a number of email exchanges. And Patrir is doing a peace building and peace uh, uh, peace building and conflict mediation, and they are. Uh, helping Ukrainian refugees in the country. They're a very small organization with limited staff and limited resources, very close to where Petrir is located. The United States is, is wanting to expand the, the air base. About an hour away is a big uh, military base uh, that's where fighter jets uh, and uh, you know training exercises are being held. And this is going to be expanded and people are worried. While I was in Romania, Canada had a fleet of CF-18 fighter jets that were using the, the uh, base Camp, Campia Turzi near Cluj Napoca, as well as the, the air base on the, the, the coast of Romania on the Black Sea, which is very close to Crimea. Um, over the past uh, uh, five years, Canadian fighter jets have been on a rotation going to Romania. Now, while I was in Bucharest, the NATO foreign ministers were having a two-day meeting. And um, the, it, the meeting was being held at the parliamentary palace. And I just want you to look carefully at this photo. You can see the fence is, is crumbling. Um, across the street from the parliamentary palace, where the NATO summit was being held, is the big Department of Defense. And outside on the main street is this big monument uh, to NATO. All around the city were flags for NATO, were these big billboards, we are NATO. And uh, where the foreign ministers were, were, um, were, were staying were, was at this luxury hotel across the street called the Marriott. Um, um, but and, and this is, of course, the inside of the of the um, parliamentary palace. This is this is their meeting, and it's you know it's very luxurious. They took a bus from the, the from the hotel, you know, straight into the parliament and back. What they didn't see, you know, just a stone throw away, was just the rampant of poverty all around the city. I was shocked by the level of disrepair and despair in the city. Uh, the infrastructure is crumbling, the buildings are, the, the outside is, is crumbling. It's just, it's, it's really shocking to see this all over. Now, during the two day meeting, very um, sadly and regrettably, the president of Romania, Klaus Ionis, announced that Romania was going to increase their military spending from 2% of GDP to 2.5% of GDP. And if you look at this chart, you can see that uh, Romania has increased their military spending. This is in US dollars from $2 billion in 2014 to $6 billion annually, but there's so much need and so much poverty in the country and they could instead be investing in, in repairing their infrastructure, in uh, you know, helping the people in healthcare and education and jobs. And you can see in, in Poland and Latvia, the other Eastern European countries that are NATO members, how military spending has, has dramatically in, increased. And this, these statistics are from the latest NATO defense expenditures report. At the end of the NATO summit, the foreign ministers announced that they are going to increase their support, their weapons to Ukraine. They are going to to support Ukraine for as long as it takes to defeat Russia, you know this is is very troubling. And they also made an announcement uh, the, um, that they are going to uh, they they are going to you know take on China. This Euro Atlantic alliance of thirty NATO members are going to uh, treat uh, China as another threat. So I stood outside the meeting with my banner, no to NATO, yes to peace and cooperation. And I was prompt, promptly stopped by the police. I was not allowed to protest. At uh, the last day of, my, of um, my stay in Romania, there was a big military parade to celebrate Independence Day. 
and they had fighter jets and tanks. And uh, this is a picture of their of, of a military a vehicle. This is a a rocket a missile launcher, a rocket launcher. And the young man next to me said, this is the type of rocket launcher that's being used in Ukraine right now. Um, and uh, there were also American, fly American flags and soldiers uh, marching in this parade. And I, I want to show you what uh, the map looks like of these NATO operations in Eastern Europe. So, you know, you can see this, this uh, this dark uh, division uh, with Russia, all of these soldiers and and warships and and you know and tanks and it's it's terrible. This is the air uh, defense that they have, you know, in this region. And what I did is I mapped out all of the connections that people had told me that they have uh, with Russia and with other countries in Eastern Europe. And so I think what needs to take place is building bridges, is make, maintaining these connections between Eastern Europe and Russia. You know, imagine if we replaced all of these soldiers and tanks and fighter jets and warships of NATO with peacemakers and peace builders. So my final observations and reflections from my trip is that uh, the region of Eastern Europe is being highly militarized from NATO expansion and operations. And you can see that from the maps, militarism and military spending is rising and it's making poverty and the climate change much worse. Uh, what Canada is doing in the region is exacerbating tensions and hostility. There's very little diplomacy, peace building and peace education taking place. Um, there is a, you know, a vast uh, network of connections in the region. We should be uh, strengthening these, uh, these connections, not sowing division and hostility. Uh, there can't be any kind of just transition or climate justice without ending war, demilitarizing this region and uh, building peace. And uh, as I've said at the beginning of my presentation, I'm convinced that the protracted uh, hot war in Ukraine and the Cold War against both Russia and China will prevent the achievement of the Paris Agreement goal and, and the Sustainable Development Goals. This is why it's so important that we work to end these wars. And I also refuse to treat Russia and China as enemies. I want peace in Ukraine and I want peace with all countries. We are interdependent and our only hope is global solidarity. NATO should be abolished abolished and we need to build a global movement and support those people in Eastern Europe that are, are courageously, courageously trying to stand up to NATO in their countries and we need to be in solidarity with them. And I want to end with a quote. When I got back uh, from Yuri, my friend who lives in Kiev, uh, he was the first person that I reached out to when I got back to share um, I, I wanted to speak to him about my sh trip and to, to hear what he had to say. And he said, we need to challenge the system. We need to change the regime of militarism everywhere. We need a nonviolent way of life. We need to be, we need peace education and peace building in every country. Um, so I'd like to share some resources with you. And I want to also encourage you to go to Russia, you know, go to these, go to these uh, countries and make friends like I did. I'm so glad that I went and I want to go back and bring my family. Um, we need a new architecture uh, for common security that brings in Russia and brings in China. And these are some examples, the United Nations, our common agenda report, uh, the world beyond wars, global security system report, International Peace Bureau's uh, new initiative on common security. And I would like to bring to your attention Medea Benjamin's new book and her, and, and her, her video. Uh, the, the links we'll put in the chat. And finally, I want to encourage you to get involved in the No to War, No to NATO network and to sign the important new petition from the International Peace Bureau, the Christmas appeal to end the war in Ukraine, peace in Ukraine and peace with Russia. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Tamara. That was truly so informative and incredible. And I think I, I see lots of people in the chat echoing the sentiment that this was uh, incredibly helpful. Um, I'm going to answer Mariah's question in the chat, which is, will there be a Q&A? Yes, we are about to enter 
the Q&A portion of this event. Uh, we have about 30 minutes allocated for Q&A time. I've been collecting uh, some of the questions that have been posted in the chat, but I will do my best to uh, try to keep track of other questions that are asked. Um, but again, thank you so much, Tamara. That was truly so informative, so helpful, and congratulations on, on such an important trip and effort. Um, our first question that I'd like to spotlight here is from Morgan. Morgan asks, the climate science from previous climate seven summits, even from Paris Accord, was already depicting the earth as a hothouse graveyard for humanity. Some modeling in mainstream media speculated disastrous three degrees Celsius was possible. Despite our leader's somber inaction in the past, much has worsened since then, i.e. war and monopolist war economies and sanctions, shifting global power, breakdown of cooperation, cooperation, et cetera. Should the best available science consider these new emerging factors when making their future predictions? If so, how can international advocacy play a role to give us a clearer picture and help shift the world towards people, planet, and peace? There's a lot there, Tamara, but I'll pass it over to you and happy to repeat if you'd like. This is why I started my presentation talking about the climate summit. Because the science of climate change, what is happening with global warming uh, should be informing all of the decisions that we're making. And because the climate emergency is so serious, um, uh, you know, this is, this is why this, this is why we, we, why we need to end this war in Ukraine. This is why we need to uh, end this enmity with, uh, with Russia and China. Uh, we need to partner with these countries so that we can all succeed, that we can rapidly reduce emissions, we can reduce our military budgets and reallocate them to climate action. Uh, at my meeting at the Moscow University, I was telling them about how climate change was adversely impacting Canada and telling them about the town of Lytton being burnt down to the ground and how there were out of control forest fires at the same time that there were out of control forest fires in Russia across Siberia. Um, many people think, or they'll say that the Amazon, the Brazilian rainforest is, you know, the lungs of the planet, but lungs come in pairs and the other lungs of, 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 you know, of the world is the boreal forest that Canada and Russia share. And so we need to be protecting the, the, the rainforest in the Amazon and the boreal forest in in Canada and Russia, and this is going to require global cooperation. The other thing is the Arctic. That was another issue that we talked about at, at the university. And um, the Arctic is you know, a fragile ecosystem, which is one of the fastest warming regions on the planet. And uh, you know, we are going to need to cooperate with Russia on protecting the Arctic and uh, trying to uh, prevent um, catastrophic climate change. There's something called the Arctic Council that Canada helped establish about uh, 27 years ago, and it's a forum for Arctic countries to come together to collaborate and work on, you know, issues in the Arctic. But you know, now because of this this cold war with Russia and this hot war in Ukraine. Um, Canada doesn't want to meet with Russia at the Arctic Council and to try to deal with these issues. And instead, what's happening is Canada is is militarizing the Arctic. Canada now, through uh, NORAD, is going to be spending seventy eight billion dollars to to militarize the Arctic. There's going to be new fighter jet runways, new military bases, new uh, military satellites, uh, seabed sensors. And you know this militarism, so carbon intensive, is just going to make the, the climate crisis worse. You know, if we were, um, if we were dealing, 
um, you know, if we we should be ending this war in Ukraine. We should be working peacefully with Russia. So, that, uh, you know, on, on the, these common global challenges that we're facing, catastrophic climate change and global poverty. So, um, Morgan, you, you know, you're absolutely right. The, the, the science of climate change really is so serious and should be informing our foreign policy choices. And this is why, you know, peace is absolutely essential. And, you know, peace is a, a cr crucial pillar of climate justice and climate action. And that was really clear at COP27 from uh, many activists, including the WELP delegation. And that was the message that we tried to bring uh, uh, to the conference. Thank you so much. That was a really, really thorough answer. Much appreciated. Um, I'm gonna move on to another question here, which is from Anne. And we have a lot of questions pouring in, so we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and as is being said in the chat, um, all of the reports that we're mentioning here today and resources will be attached in emails um, to the registrants to this event. So you should be able to receive that uh, just for folks that are asking about that in the chat. Um, but to our next question, um, Anne asks uh, and says uh, that she agrees with Tamara on the origins of the tragic decision for the Russian government to invade Ukraine. She has visited Ukraine, excuse me, visited Russia on two citizen diplomacy trips each of 15 days and visited Crimea in 2016. That said, did the Moscow universities know the extent of Russian military attacks on civilian infrastructure of Ukraine? And I guess it'd be interesting to know like how they reacted if that was, or how that was a part of their analysis, if that was a part of it. Um, I would say, uh, yes, they do. They know about uh, the destruction on both sides of the contact line. There were some students that, like I said, you know, supported what Russia was doing and many who didn't, and they are very much opposed to violence, very much, very much opposed to uh, the use of armed force. Many of the students did tell me that uh, Russia had tried for many years to put out peace proposals to, you know, try to prevent this. Uh, some of them felt like, uh, you know, Russia had no option. Of course, I believe that there's there's always op options that you, that you never need to resort to, to violence. Um, but yeah, uh, they uh, they did they did know. It it pained many Russians to know um, what was happening and um, you know the violence that. The Russian government, the, the Russian military was inflicting, and and what NATO uh, backed U Ukrainian security forces were also um, inflicting. Thank you so much. That is much appreciated. I'm going to move on to a question from Yuri here. Yuri asks, "What has been the impact of sanctions and collective punishment on Russia? Are more people turning to the left?" Is it pushing Putin to abandon his fiscal conservatism or, and what are the efforts to overcome this? Um, Big question. <laughs> well, the sanctions, uh, the sanctions are adversely affecting the Russian people in, in many different ways. So uh, for instance, they can't easily travel outside the country, uh, for instance, to attend peace conferences or uh, visit family and friends, um, you know, for work. And uh, many of them have lost jobs and contracts. And um, I also heard about uh, one man who lives in Romania told me that he has an ex-wife and a young son that live who live in Siberia, and he's not able to get support payments to them. And um, uh, there, there were many Russians that did say that they are very unhappy with um, with President Putin and with the government and the decision to uh, to invade Ukraine. Uh, to engage in this special military operation in this war. Um, uh, they are very fearful of 
of speaking out or protesting because they know they'll be arrested. And um, uh, so, yeah, this, the sanctions are definitely having an impact, are definitely having an impact. I also did hear that, you know, there are, there are many Russians that do uh, support what their government is doing. And um, they all, and conversely, you know, many said that they feel that they're being propagandized to, and um, yeah, so it was a diversity of views and opinions, um, but definitely the, the sanctions are, are hurting them. And really these sanctions are forms of uh, collective punishment. Uh, if, if you think that Americans Canadians, you know, have never suffered from these kinds of sanctions for, you know, our brutal war in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in Libya and, uh, you know, the bombing, our bombing or two year bombing of Syria and Iraq, for instance. So, um, yeah, Russians are hurting from this. Thank you for your thoughts on that. And, and I'm seeing a lot of, uh, questions and, and thoughts in the chat about sort of the, the level of divisiveness that we've been discussing throughout this entire presentation or that you've been discussing and the way in which we've really been trained to see and told to see that, you know, the other is the enemy and that sort of rhetoric. So I'm going to focus on a question from Charlene here that I think encompasses some of the thoughts that have been mentioned in the chat so far um, on that. And Charlene says, um, I agree with all Tamara said but my family so disagrees with me that they won't discuss with me. They've been convinced that Russia is the source of all evil. How can I get around this? I think that kind of speaks to the greater peace building and civilian diplomacy aspect that you've been speaking about. Um, we'd love to hear more about that. Uh, um, my um, contact in uh, Wrocław, Poland was saying that you know, she's really observed this construction of the enemy in Poland and that, you know, many Polish people see uh, uh, Russia as the, as the enemy and not only in Poland, but also in Romania and in Latvia. And I see it very much taking place in Canada as well. You know, this is a concerted effort to treat Russia as an enemy by the government, by the media, even by our educational institutions. I see it at my university. But if, if we have this approach uh, to Russia, if we have this approach to China and to Iran and to North Korea, we, we just, um, you know, we can't, we, we are not going to be able to solve our collective uh, problems. The climate emergency, global poverty and inequality. And, um, and uh, you know, this is a well-funded concerted campaign by, by the government, by the media, by NATO to create these divisions, to, you know, to continue to see Russia as an enemy. Um, it serves their interests. It's, it's, it serves their interests for militarism and increasing military spending. But I, I'm at the point that I just want to reject all of this. I want to overcome it. I want to transform it. I want to, I, I want to, you know, to end this war in Ukraine as soon as possible. I want to end this cold war with Russia. I, I want to prevent, you know, a, a war with China. I, 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 I want to, I want to make friends. I want to find how I can, you know, make friends and find positive things. And what can I, what can I learn? You know, what can we learn as a country from Russia? Um, I think we need to start telling, you know, different stories. And so, you know, this is why I wanted to go on this trip and, you know, meet people and to make these um, heart connections with them and, and try to find ways to build bridges. So I, I just want to encourage people to be creative, to overcome like the, the, the hatred, the Russophobia, the xenophobia, the, 
you know, the hostility, just we have to learn to transform this because we are running out of time on the climate emergency and on, and on, the, you know, um, uh, the, you know, collapsing nature, the ecological uh, crisis that we're in as well. And so we, we just have to end the hostility and divisions. So think creatively, tell some positive stories about Russia, um, you know, start immediately today to build bridges. Thank you. I love that. I love that comment about starting now. But there's no there's no time to waste. I think that's really important. Um, I'd like to highlight. Actually, you're speaking of you know creative solutions. I wanted to highlight something that uh, Kathy wrote in the chat. Um, Kathy wrote, "Please help us continue imagining ways to build relationships among people who want to live together without killing. If possible, could you comment on the? Oh goodness, I'm going to butcher this word. Zaporizhia protection proposal, ZPP, featured on the World Beyond War website." seeking unarmed civilian protection at the nuclear plant now under Russian control. You might be familiar, this is a project that uh, John Ruer has been working on for those of you who have been following that effort. Um, Tamara, if you have any thoughts on that as, as one possible creative solution, um, we'd love to hear about that. Well, I don't know the details about it. I yeah. did speak to John briefly about it and I think that it's a, a fantastic idea and I, think that there's going to be a World Beyond War uh, webinar about this soon. And I believe Oleg is going to be uh, speaking about it. Uh, uh, he did tell me that there were um, air raids in his town uh, recently, um, uh, like, uh, you know, kind of preparing people in Russia for the possibility of you know, of an attack. And so, you know, people are very concerned about, about um, a nuclear escalation, about a nuclear power plant being blown up because there are many nuclear uh, power plants, uh, you know, in Russia as well as in um, Ukraine and, and of course, nuclear weapons. And so, um, you know, this is what makes this conflict uh, so serious, so dangerous, and why we we absolutely need to end it, and why we need nuclear disarmament, and why we need to uh, rapidly move to uh, renewable energy, not nuclear power. Um, so I I support this initiative, and I support people who are working on it, and uh, whatever uh, creative ideas that you have for for building peace in the region uh, would be just really very welcome. And like I said, I encourage you, you to make plans to go to, to, to go to any part of the region and, and support uh, peace initiatives. Thank you. I really appreciate your answer to that question. And yes, do keep an eye out for more information on that. Uh, I believe Greta is sending more information in the chat. Um, I have another question here, sort of more about the big picture messaging that you heard, I guess, both from your trip to Russia and Eastern Europe and also from COP. Um, from all the people that you spoke to, what seems to be, from what seems to be a pilgrimage of peace and empathy, were there any memorable conversations that you think Western leaders absolutely need to hear? Which dialogue stood out the most? And can you paraphrase for us and why it's important? Um, Only the hard-hitting questions for you. I, I think, <laughs> Thank you. I think. I think the meeting in Warsaw with, um, uh, with the Ukrainian refugees and, and with this, uh, Romanian man, um, um, and just you know to to hear, uh, you know Ukrainian men who have been adversely affected by this war on the West and on the East, um, you know, who have, who have lost their homes, who have uh, had uh, family members 
um, you know, injured, uh, have, have family members or friends, you know, injured or killed, and um, and then you know, saying how you know terrible it is, and and how they you know they don't want this war, they want it to end immediately, they um, they want to go back to their country, they want to uh, rebuild, and they didn't want to fight. Um, you know, it was really you know uh, powerful to to have that conversation with them. And they also showed pictures on their on their phones, you know, from the destruction from their communities. And like I said, it was it was Ukrainian men on on, on both sides. And um, we don't hear very much from um, you from Ukrainians on the Donbass side and 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 how um, NATO you uh, get back Ukrainian security forces are are you know are harming the people there um and so it was really good to be able to you know to, to hear directly fr from a Ukrainian man who has been um you know who who has suffered and uh and then just how uh they feel like they are brothers and um yeah, it was just really a powerful conversation. But I had so many, I, I felt really like profound and heartfelt conversations with people. I, my eyes were opened and my heart was touched and I, I really learned a lot. And I feel like I've made kind of friends for life and I would like to go back. And I would also be happy to share the contacts that I made with people. If, if any of you decide to go and you want to like look up some of these, people and and make friends because i really think that we do need to strengthen these relationships and um so you know plan a trip next year for sure thank you so much for that really important question i know that we're we're running out of time a little bit here i do want to see if we can fit in another one or two questions um i'm seeing a lot of different discussions in the chat sort of um, talking about, you know, Ukraine and Russia and Ukrainians versus Russians. And I know that uh, Greta has been clarifying in the chat sort of the world beyond war stance um, on that regard. Um, and I would love to hear Greta, excuse me, not Greta, Tamara, if you want to speak a bit more about sort of, uh, as you just were, the suffering of Ukrainians and perhaps um, how we can factor in sort of the trying to think of the best way to phrase this, um, you know, Russia's role in that too, and the way in which we can oppose, you know, oppose Russian war making, oppose NATO war making, opposing sending weapons to Ukraine, how we can really oppose violence from all sides while also standing in solidarity with Ukrainians. Um, I know we mentioned Yuri um, in this webinar, who is a World Beyond War board member who calls for peace as a Ukrainian. Um, and I was wondering if you wanted to speak a bit about that messaging and sort of um, anything that your experience um, on your trip sort of uh, taught you about, about that approach that we have so far. Sorry, that was a bit all over the place. So I hope, you, I hope that that is helpful. <laughs> I, I want to emphasize that I, you know, I'm, I'm totally opposed to, you know, the violence on all sides. And I made that very clear to the, to, to everyone that I spoke to in the region. Uh, and, you know, I was explicit about that in Russia to let them know. But I also said to them, you know, I was there, you know, to, to listen to what they had to say. Um, and, um, uh, um yeah I, i'm what as you were saying that question or opposing that question maya i was thinking about how like the united states is now going to be increasing their military spending to to, to even higher i don't think 860 billion dollars or something you know and you know russia is obviously having to increase their military spending they spend about one twelfth what the united states spends but all of these countries are increasing their military spending. I showed it on one of my slides. And this, this, this war making is uh, so costly to the public and to the planet. It's, um, 
you know, it's, it's impeding the progress that we're trying to make at the international level on all of these, you know, important challenges around uh, climate and the environment and, um, you know, gender equality, um, uh, development on, you know, on everything. And so uh, we, we, we need to stop this militarism. We need to, to uh, reduce this military spending. And we're not going to be able to do it if, uh, in, if we don't, um, if we don't have, you know, the, the courage, the courage for peace. Like we, we need to be able to um, be clear and unequivocal in our call to abolish NATO. Right? NATO is 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 the worst uh, war machine. If we can, you know, and, and as a Canadian, I feel very responsible for what Canada is doing. Canada is, is you know, is a NATO is a NATO member with all of these NATO operations in Eastern Europe. You know, I'm going to be calling on the government, you know, to to close them down, to uh, close down the military bases, and to reduce military spending, and you know, to invest in peacemaking. This is something that we need to all need to be doing. You know, the Russians need to be calling on their government to 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 stop its war making. Um, and you know, we need to be to stand in solidarity with them. We need to disarm. We need to demilitarize. Russia needs to disarm and demilitarize. But it's going to require us working on it. You know, on that together. Uh, but. But I think that the West is 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 most responsible here. You know, it's it's uh, it's, it's the most responsible, and we are we are responsible for our governments. So I just, you know, in, encourage us again to just uh, think of creative ways to to engage in this peace building, to engage in this uh, this peacemaking, and to end this militarism. Thank you so much, Tamara. I think that's a fantastic note to end on. Um, and the militarism and the weapons and the military system at large. That's what we're all about here. Um, before we close out the event here today, I'd really like to say one more big thank you to Tamara for all of your hard work and for speaking to us for a very full hour and a half. Um, that is not an easy feat after an already exhausting trip. So thank you so much again. Your thoughts and, and expertise are much appreciated. Um, for all of you here today, I'd also like to flag an event coming up this Sunday. Um, if you are interested in the topic of militarism at large, um, I'm going to flag that event coming up on Canadian imperialism and Haiti going on right now. I'm putting that in the chat, so please do uh, register. Again, uh, our message is um, to end the war. Let's all stop the let's stop all the fighting now. And that is where we'll end today. Thank you again so much, Tamara. Have a good Thanks rest of your Thanks everyone for coming. Everyone.